Welcome to Epicenter, the show which talks about the technologies, projects, and people driving decentralization and the blockchain revolution. I'm Friederike Ernst, and today I'm speaking with Benny Francesco, who is the CEO of Scopelift and creator of Umbra, a privacy layer for ETH-based token transfers. Ben, it's the title to have you on. Yeah, thank you so much for having me. Really appreciate it. Excited to chat. <laughs> cool. So um, I think the very uh, uh, the very clear first question here is: Tell us about yourself. Who are you? How did you get into this space? And is it true you are originally an aerospace engineer? Uh, yeah, sure, absolutely. Yes, I am originally an aerospace engineer. So. Um, uh, believe it or not, uh, growing up, I was uh, kind of a nerd. And so uh, I was interested <laughs> in, I know, really shocking, unusual in this space, very unusual. But um, but uh, so I was interested in computers from a very early age. I kind of like played around and started teaching myself to, to program. I was also interested in like aviation and aerospace and, you know, NASA and all that kind of stuff. And so I went to school for aerospace engineering because I was very excited about that. And I really enjoyed kind of the coursework and the, you know, the sort of like overall idea of doing aerospace engineering. And then when I got out of school, I went to work at a large aerospace engineering firm here in the States. And what I learned pretty quickly is that the reality of aerospace engineering, at least at these big firms, is very different from kind of the, um, you know, uh, idealistic view that I had as a, as a young kid going to study it. So in reality, you know, aerospace engineering, for good reason, is very um, slow, basically. You know, you can work on a project, an aircraft project, for, for many years before it can come to fruition. There are a lot of people involved in any given project. And in general, especially, again, at these big firms, things are very bureaucratic and slow moving. And it also turns out that at these uh, big firms, engineering firms, traditional engineering firms, really in general, they desperately need more people to program because there's all kinds of stuff that needs to be done software-wise, building software, but uh, it's hard to get people that uh, have the knowledge to build the software, but also have the engineering side of things. And so within um, this large firm, I was doing all software engineering work anyway. And what I realized was that I wasn't loving my job. I loved, I really enjoyed the programming side of things, the software side of things. What I didn't like was the bureaucracy, the top heaviness, the slow moving side of things. Um, and so I left uh, Boeing and went into kind of, I basically started freelancing and then eventually grew my company Scopelift into a consulting firm, a dev shop, for lack of a better word. And uh, this was probably around 2012, 2013. At the time, I was not doing work in crypto, but I was following crypto. So I had found Bitcoin. I had, was really fascinated by it. And I was following the project. I was doing stuff on the side, um, you know, for fun. I uh, like built a, a, a mining rig and I was mining Dogecoin, believe it or not, um, like at probably at a loss in my house, but like paying more for the electricity than than the Dogecoin I was mining. But um, but I was following it. There wasn't really much of a crypto industry at the time, except for like a few uh, companies um, out there. So it was really when Ethereum launched that I uh, sort of got really excited about crypto because I realized this was it, it went from like, oh, this is an interesting kind of um interesting kind of, you know, thing, digital scarcity that's been invented to, oh, this is like a whole new platform. And as a software engineer, I can build things on top of this. And this is going to allow us to create all brand new kinds of software that do things we couldn't previously do before. And so that kind of, when I learned about smart contracts and saw Ethereum coming together, that like um, light bulb kind of went off. And so again, I continued to sort of follow the project, started tinkering with Ethereum and smart contracts. And then it really wasn't until uh, 20, the boom of 2017 into like 2018 when I started picking up projects. Uh, Scopelift started picking up projects. By this time, it was a, a small consultancy and we started picking up actual crypto projects. And by 2019, I decided to really sh um, shift the firm 100% into focusing on crypto. So we wound up our, our legacy projects, our Web2, and kind of uh, we were doing some native mobile work as well and decided to focus 100% on crypto sort of having to start from the ground up with business development and all that kind of stuff. But um, but uh, really, it's been an, an awesome ride because, as you know, the space in, you know, since 2019, the space has changed an enormous amount. And we've had the opportunity in that time to to really contribute to a whole bunch of stuff in the Ethereum ecosystem in particular and, and some other ecosystems as well. But mainly we're focused in Ethereum. And, um, and that's been really gratifying and a lot of fun. And uh, yeah, that's kind of the long-winded explanation to your question. Can you tell us about some of the projects you've contributed to um, over the years? 
Yeah, absolutely. We've done a lot of work with a lot of great projects. We've been lucky to get to contribute to, you know, uh, projects. Certainly, your audience would have heard of Optimism, um, uh, Gitcoin. We've done a ton of work with them. Uniswap, uh, Endowment, um, Obol, a bunch of other uh, really, really cool projects. And then, of course, we also have done some of our own internal projects over the years um, with varying degrees of success. And the one that has a decent amount of ha has probably the most traction of the the internal stuff that we've built is uh, Umbra. Umbra is also the project we're here to talk about today. Um, but maybe before we dive into that, how is it kind of being a hired gun on some uh, some projects and kind of um, scurring that with building your own? I, I imagine that's a really difficult line to toe. Yeah, I mean, uh, yes and no. I mean, I think... Um, me personally, and I think as a culture, the company selects for this, we're like, we're a seven person team. We're all engineers. We're all very, we just like to build things. Um, basically I think would be the culture. And so it's like really a culture focused on, on engineering excellence. And you come to us with hard problems and we help you solve them is kind of the approach that, uh, that we take. And, you know, I think like, I just have fun. We have fun doing that. Right. So I think it's, um, I am always, uh, impressed when people can, um, you know, find an idea that they're so passionate about, like a singular project that they're willing to sort of grind on that for years and years and years. Uh, my mind likes to kind of jump all over the place. And so it's been awesome to get to contribute to a whole bunch of uh, different projects and to, you know, have a few things going on at any given time. Um, it also just gives us like a really wide view of the space because there is so much going on, right? And, and even with that wide view, it's like it used, you know, in 2017-ish, you could reasonably like have a, a sense of everything going on in Ethereum as one person, if you were really paying attention. By then it was starting to already get hard. Now it's like literally impossible. You can barely keep a, an eye on a sliver of the activity that's happening in the ecosystem at any given time. But, you know, we, we get to, we get to see a, a relative to, to maybe other folks, we get to see a wide breadth of that. So that's a lot of fun. Of course, there is some tension with our client work and our own projects that we would like to, to push forward. But we've been really lucky, especially with Umbra, to you know get funding in the form of grants from a lot of different uh, sources, a number of different sources in the ecosystem, um, and so we've been able to you know uh, push that forward while at the same time balancing it, balancing it with our uh, client work in the ecosystem. In a nutshell, um, what does Umbra set out to do? Yeah, cool. So Umbra is a privacy tool. It's a stealth address system. And um, it's different from some of the privacy tools that maybe your audience would be used to. So it's primarily about receiving uh, payments um, or, or receiving a transaction set, sent to you by uh, a known sender where the fact that they've sent it to you isn't, um, isn't immediately, le isn't legible on chain, isn't obvious on chain. So another way to say that is it's about receiving payments where only the sender and the receiver know who the receiver is, right? So. The sender is visible on chain. The receiver is stealth. That's the stuff where the stealth address uh, side of things comes into play. Um, so unlike some other tools that your um, audience may be familiar with, you know, like Tornado Cash being the the most prominent example, for example, would be uh, it, it's not a mixer, right? So a mixer is primarily um, about taking funds that you control but are, you know, doxxed in some way. They're, they're, it's, it's known that you control these funds in this address and then moving them through the mixer. And when they come out the other side of the mixer, they're in an address that you control, but it's no longer clear that you're the owner of them. So it's breaking the link between address A and address B, both of which are controlled by the same entity, right? Um, that's not what Umbra does. That's what a mixer does. And we're not a mixer. So Umbra is about... Um, I want to receive a payment. It could be e-commerce. It could be, you know, you're paying an invoice because I'm a business and we worked together. Could be you're paying my salary, you know, um, whatever it is. We have some economic relationship. You want to pay me, but we don't all want it to be obvious on chain that you have sent this amount of money to me. So um, if you use Umbra, basically what it looks like is you've sent some tokens or some ether to uh, an address that has never been seen before on chain. Now, behind the scenes, it turns out that I control that address and only I control that address. And as soon as you've sent those funds, they're essentially custodied by me uh, and could not you couldn't recover them. No one else could recover them. Only I have the ability to uh, remove them from that stealth address that they've been sent to. But on chain, who that address is controlled by is uh, not uh, visible or legible at all. 
So that's uh, sort of a, a quick summary of, of what Umbra enables. So if I look at um, my uh, regular, say, MetaMask, um, it lets me derive um, a de facto unlimited number of addresses from a single C trace, right? So basically, if we coordinate ahead of time, what I could do is I could just um, I could just make a new address from the seed phrase that I'm already using and give you that. But what Umbra actually does, it actually lets you kind of, I mean, it works differently. We'll talk about how it works in just a bit, but it will let you generate a new address on my behalf, right? Yeah, that's a great, that's exactly right. That's a great way to think about it, right? So yes, like the privacy uh, sort of trade-offs that you get from Umbra are the same as if you, uh, if I, you were going to pay me and I generated a fresh address, you know, just went into MetaMask and clicked add new or created some, some private keys and imported it, whatever, generated a fresh address and then sent that address to you. And then you sent the funds to that address. That's, that's the privacy, the trade, the privacy, uh, properties that you would get from that interaction are the privacy properties that you get from Umbra. The difference is that it's a non-interactive protocol. In other words, we don't have to do that out of band coordination um, in order for you to get a fresh address that only I control. You can, as you alluded to, effectively generate um, a, a fresh address on my behalf that only I can control, but still looks completely, um, completely unused and new on chain. And uh, it basically looks like a regular address on chain um, it, it 100% looks like a regular address on chain. There's nothing. There's nothing special about it because it is. It is a special address. It's just generated using some cryptography. Okay, so basically, it's saying I want to pay you, um, say, fifteen dai or whatever. How do I go about creating this address um, that you and only you um, have the private key to? Cool. Yeah. So, do you want to dive into this from? at the technical level, at like the user experience level, like where yeah, do you want to start talk, with this? Because there's yeah, another direction. Yeah, I think that's a great question. Let's um, let's get the maths straight first, and then we can go through the user experience after. Okay, cool. So I'm going to describe the way that it works in Umbra today. And the principle is the same, right? The underlying math principle is the same. There are slightly different constructions, like ways that you could put it together. Um, and so like different stealth address schemes might have slightly different constructions. But I'm going to describe the one that we use in Umbra, and the underlying, you know, uh, principles are all the same regardless of the exact implementation details. So um, to to do that, I'm going to have to back up a little bit and talk about elliptic curve cryptography, which is the kind of cryptography that underlies basically all of Ethereum, right? So elliptic curve cryptography is asymmetric cryptography. In other words, you have not just um, you know, with symmetric cryptography, you have a private key and you use that private key to encrypt something and then you use that key to decrypt something. So the, the key is the secret and the, the key lets you uh, encrypt it and decrypt it, right? In asymmetric, asymmetric cryptography, you have a private key and you have a public key, right? And so that, it, and those two things are a pair, right? So for every private key, there's an associated public key and vice versa. And if you have the public key, you can't derive the, pr the private key but you can use the public key to encrypt something. So to take some text or data and encrypt it so that it can't be viewed. And then once that's encrypted with the public key, only the owner of the private key can decrypt it, right? So this is what we use in things like, you know, um, you know, private uh, chat apps, right? Like Signal or whatever, right? So I, you know, the app does this process where you can see my public key and then you send, you take, you write a message, the app encrypts it with my public key, sends it to me, I decrypt it once on it's on my device with my private key. When it went over the wire, uh, nobody could could read it, right? Um, so that's the same cryptography that underlies all of Ethereum. And the private key and the public key in these um, scenarios are just uh, big numbers, right? So they're big integers. Um, and your Ethereum address, the Ethereum address that you have in MetaMask, um, is derived from the public key of the associate of the private key, right? So it's actually the hash of your uh, of your public key just defines your Ethereum address. And so when you send a transaction on Ethereum, you sign it with that uh, private key, with the private key, and then you broadcast it out, then the people running nodes have to validate that the signature is correct and then execute whatever actions it has to include it in the blockchain. Okay, sorry for that, um, that background, but I think it's important to establish what I'm gonna talk about next, which is how, getting back to how Umbra works, right? 
So the way that it turns out, right, and this is just a, a property of the math, but it turns out within elliptic curve cryptography, you have this big number for your private key and this big number for your public key. Um, and the math that's going on isn't like normal math, right? It's not like the math where we where we multiply numbers together, right? The way that we we're, we learned to do it in, in grade school, right? It's a different kind of math called elliptic uh, curve math, basically. And I, I won't get into exactly what that is and how it works because it's out, it's even further outside of the scope than the scuff I've already described. But basically, it turns out the way that it, the way that the the properties of of this math and the way that it works is if you take the number that is your private key and you pick another number, a random number, and you multiply it by that random number. So private key times random number gives you another new number, right? If you use that number, you you can use that number as a private key and generate a new public key, right? With me so far, is that making sense? So private yes. key times random number, new new number, new private key, right? So if it turns out, if you go back to that original private key, the associated public key, if you take that public key and you multiply it by the same random number, right? Then the public, the, the resulting number that you get, the resulting public key that you get is the public key that associates with or is paired with that private key that we got in the first step, right? So in fact, the way that Umbra works is in reverse. So what you as the sender do or what the software does on your behalf behind the scenes is it takes a public key associated with the receiver it multiplies it by a big random number and it generates a new public key from that operation. And again, this is all elliptic curve math that's going on, not normal math. Um, and then what the user on the other side, the receiver can do is take that same, if you can communicate that same random number to the user, and we'll talk about that in a second, but if you, if you somehow send that other, that random number to the user, they can take it, multiply it by their private key and get the private key for the associated uh, public key that we that you calculated as the sender in the first step. So again, a little confusing, but um, hopefully that sort of made sense. I'll let you ask some questions. Yes, absolutely. So, but that still leaves me to get the random number to you encrypted, right? Because if I send it to you unencrypted, then anyone can just try out which public key uh, belongs to it, right? Right. Yeah. So you might be one. This is exactly. So you, basically, the question you're asking is, okay, that that sounds that sounds neat, but what good has it done? Because I still have to send you that random number before you can figure out how to generate the the new address, the new public key, which associates with the stealth address, the new address. So how do you how how do we do that? I still have to send it to you, and I might you might as well have just sent me an address, right? So like, what have we what have we gained by doing all this this math? So what Umbra so what Umbra does to make this non interactive is. Remember, we talked about how these public and private key pairs allow for this asymmetric encryption, right? So effectively, what we do then is we take the public key and we use it to encrypt that random number that we just uh, created and we use to generate the new address. And then we, once we've encrypted that random number, we take that encrypted data that nobody can decrypt except you as the holder of the private key, and we announce it on chain through an event in a smart contract, right? So Umbra is a smart contract system. There's an associated smart contract. Your funds flow through that smart contract when you make the payments. And we make an announcement, an event that gets uh, broadcast on chain with that uh, encrypted um, data in inside of it. And so then what you do as the receiver when you use Umbra is you come, you log on, and you look at all the payments that have happened through Umbra, every event that's occurred through Umbra uh, since the last time you uh, used the app. And then you basically tried to decrypt each one and you're not going to be able to decrypt most of them, but you will be able to decrypt the ones that are payments to you. And so when you decrypt them, you get that random number that you need and you can use it along with your private key to generate the private key for the new stealth address that received the funds. Um, and so we basically use uh, events on Ethereum and indexing those events, processing those events locally on your computer because we want to keep it privately, obviously, um, to enable uh, the um, this data to be communicated in a non-interactive way. Okay, I think I follow so far. Um, isn't it an awful lot of overhead for you to kind of look at every single event, not knowing whether this may be a decrypted message for you? So basically, if this is something that kind of is used at scale, is that even computationally feasible? 
Yeah, yeah, really good question. So in computer science terms, this is like an O of N problem. So it's a linear, it's, it scales linearly, right? So that's not terrible, but it's not great, right? What it means is every time someone sends a transaction, every other user of the system is going to have to decrypt, attempts to decrypt that transaction um, when they go to receive their own payments. So the way there are, there are a couple kind of approaches that you can use to deal with that. Um, and I would kind of put them in two buckets, right? One bucket is like sort of like researchy uh, sort of things, right? So you could think of like uh, gossip protocols and different things that we can do like research that we can do to take this linear problem and make it like a, a, an O log N problem, again, in computer science ter terms, right? So one that is more scalable. Um, and those are there is research being done on that. And we're very interested in that. We're kind of following it and paying attention and would like to even potentially contribute to it in the future. Um, but then the other bucket of solutions, and these are the ones that we've pursued so far, and, and there's still a bunch of more of them that we can pursue uh, to, to make things more efficient are what I would call like the engineering hack bucket of solutions, right? And so these are solutions that don't make the, they don't, they don't solve the problem in that it's still a linear, it's still an O of N problem, but they can take a lot, they can do a lot of things to um, improve the user experience, basically reduce the constant time um, uh, cost that comes with, with, with doing this, right? So in the long run, you know, if, if we were going to scale this up to every payment on earth, which by the way, I don't think it needs to, or should, like there are, are there are a lot of different privacy solutions and different ones are appropriate for different use cases. Right. And so Umbra has a set of trade-offs that are valuable in certain situations, but not necessarily everyone. But if we were to scale this up to every, every payment on earth, we, we need one of those sort of like researchy solutions to come through in order to, uh, to make this scalable. But we can get really far with uh, what I would call the kind of like engineering hacks in terms of still providing a useful uh, uh, and acceptable user experience in the sort of like short to medium term. And so that's kind of where we are today. And and I can dive into like what some of those are, some of the ones we've done already, some of the ones we're looking at in the future. But uh, but yeah, that's kind of the the high level answer. So in in my understanding of what I what I gleaned from your answer is that. Um, the computation still needs to be done in the background somewhere. It's just done such that it doesn't bother the user so much. Is that correct? Yeah, yeah. So, so like, let me let me dive into like some of those possibilities, right? So, one of them is the one that you maybe alluded to, right? So, when I described the system earlier, I uh, I said that we take the public key and we use that to generate the stealth address, and then we also take the public key and we use that to encrypt the data. In reality, in Umbra, the way that we do it is we actually have two separate public keys. And when you set up Umbra as to be a receiver to receive payments, you generate two private key, two public private key pairs, and you publish the public the two public keys in a registry. And one of those is a spending key, and the other is the viewing key. So the first one is used to generate the stealth addresses. The viewing key is used to do the encryption and decryption of these events. And so what that means is one option that you have, um, an imperfect option for sure, but at least an option, is you can give some third party that viewing key so that they can do the monitoring and decrypting on your behalf um, and then just let you know when you've received a payment. But that third party is not able to withdraw your funds. So obviously you've, you've given up your privacy to that third party, but you haven't given up uh, control of your funds to that third party. Uh, and there are a lot of, there are a lot, now that, that isn't perfect for everyone, right? There are plenty of people who are going to say, well, that's not a trade-off I, I want to make, but there are uh, plenty of people who might say that that actually does work for them. So for example, if you're using this for like receiving payments or, you know, invoice payments or salary payments or something like that, you know, just like today, you're probably okay with your, your invoicing software company or your bank or whatever, knowing about your, um, about your salary payment or your invoice payment. You, you're okay with them knowing that. You just don't want it like broadcast and legible to literally everyone who knows how to go to Etherscan, right? So um, it might be an acceptable privacy trade-off for you to give a, a, tr a trusted third party the ability to to see what you've been paid, but not withdraw the funds, right? Um, in fact, that's an improvement over today where your bank literally can see they're not really your funds at all, <laughs> right? Uh, they're the banks until you until you withdraw them. So that's one sort of like simple, simple, um, low tech solution to, to this problem. Um, putting that aside and talking about, well, what if I'm an individual user who doesn't want to give up my privacy? What options do I have? There's still a bunch of stuff out there. So one of them obviously is just like caching, right? So once you've decrypted, like 
Ethereum is, you know, past blocks are immutable, right? So once we've scanned an event once, we don't ever have to scan that one again. And so if you use Umbra to receive payments regularly, like every week or two weeks or a month, you're only going to have to scan the events from the last time and decrypt the events from the last time that you, um, that you use them. An another obvious one is just parallelization, right? These are totally independent uh, things, right? And so computers are getting more and more uh, parallel, like uh, your MacBook, you know, these days has like 32 cores or more. And so we can blast those across all the processors on your phone or your computer and uh, decrypt them in parallel. They're not contingent on each other at all. And so that that's a big help in uh, reducing the time. Um, there's another solution called view tags. Uh, this is something that actually comes from Monero. We don't have this implemented currently, but it's something that we're looking into. Um, and I won't get into the details there, but basically it's a, it's a constant time speed up where you can get as much as maybe like a 6x uh, constant time speed up on the decryption. And the, the kind of short explanation of it is like there's sort of like a two-step process. One of them is, uh, is computationally inexpensive. And then the other is the actual decryption, the process that we do today. And you can do the computationally inexpensive step to basically rule out uh, big chunks of the transactions before actually doing the full computationally expensive um, step to see if it's definitely one for you. And so you can like rule out five sixths of the transactions before you even do the expensive step and then only decrypt the expe the uh, the six that are left. And so you get a big speed up there. So uh, this is just like a, you know, a short sampling of, of some of the things that are out there, but there's a, there's a lot of juice to squeeze in terms of making this uh, fast enough to uh, work for users today before we hit hit the limit. You know, again, in the like medium term, these approaches can get us pretty far. So let me recap and then kind of let's go over the, the user experience. So to, just to kind of, uh, kind of reiterate how it works. So I want to send you funds. Um, so you have a, uh, you, you have an address, uh, you have a public address and basically I generate a random number and multiply your address by that random number. And then I encrypt the random number to send it to you. And then you can generate um, the private key to that new public uh, key that I generated with the random number. And um, I can send funds to that uh, to that address. Yep, that was a good, good summary. <laughs> the public key um, that you generate, that I go off of, is that just a standard um, Ethereum address? So basically, if I if you give me your MetaMask key, um, can I perform this? Or wh where exactly does Umbra actually come in? Yeah, yeah, really good question. So as we said earlier, a, like elliptic curve cryptography is what underlies all of Ethereum, right? So your address, any address that you use in MetaMask or whatever, is is backed by a standard public key on uh like like the ones that we use in Umbra. Um, now, the, the address itself is actually the hash of that public key. And so if you know anything about hash functions, like you can't reverse a hash function. You can verify it if you have the plain text, but you can't take a hash and figure out what the plain text was, right? So if I give you just an address, that isn't actually enough information for you to know what the pub key of that address is. Um, so the pub public key has to be shared somewhere. Now it turns out when you sign a transaction and send it to the Ethereum network, um, you effectively at that point reveal the public key of the address, right? And so once at least one transaction has been broadcast uh, on the network for a given address, we can recover the public key that underlies that address, and then we can use it in Umbra to do everything that we just described. Um, that is possible in Umbra. Like that nothing about the way Umbra works prevents you from doing that. And in fact, we even support it in our front end, but we support it behind a flag uh, that we call like an advanced mode flag. And we put like all kinds of friction in front of the user before we allow them to do that. Uh, the reason is because as the receiver, the only way for you to receive your funds is to take the private key associated with your address and to uh, then Put, put that private key into a wallet or like the front end of Umbra that supports looking for these transactions, right? That, that gives you all the functionality. And so obviously we don't want users pasting their private keys into like random uh, front ends, even our own, right? It's just not a good security practice that we want users um, getting in the habit of doing. 
And so we allow you to do it if you know what you're doing. Like our app is open source. You can pull it down locally, run it locally, paste your private key in there if you want feeling better about that we're not logging it or something like that. If you know how to audit the code yourself, et cetera. But it's not something anybody should do normally. And so the way we have it set up um, is when you come to the Umbra app as a, as a default user, if you don't go through the trouble of turning on this advanced mode, you sign a very specific message, a human readable message. It says like, you know, this, this message is used to generate your Umbra keys. Um, you sign that message and we use the signature to generate uh, two public private key pairs, the viewing key and the spending key that we talked about before. And what this allows you to do is we generate those keys from the signature from your address. And so only you as your as the wallet holder can generate those keys, um, but you know you don't have to back up any new key material, right? So if your seed phrase is backed up somewhere, you know in a safe or where on a piece of steel, um, then you know you're you're fine as long as you can recover that that address, you can sign that message and uh, recover your Umber funds as well. So no new key material comes into play, but it's still not actually the underlying key that's used for all of your other uh, Ethereum stuff. And then once we've generated that public private key, those two public private key pairs, we publish the two public keys in a registry. So it's just a really simple contract that you store, you know, you take your address, you associate it with two public keys. Uh, and then as a sender, you would come and you would look up your, the software, it looks up in that registry, the address and pulls the public key for the viewing key and the spending key, you know, uses the spending key to generate the address, uses the viewing key to encrypt it and announce it on Umbra. Um, so that's the uh, the kind of scheme and the approach that we've taken for kind of like a, a user safety uh, user safety reasons. But Umbrella is only a web app, or can I download this as a desktop app? Because that would kind of alleviate a lot of your security concerns, no? Yeah, really good question. Right now, it's only a web app, um, and we host it uh, in the front end ourselves. We've explored before maybe packaging it up, you know, like using some of these technologies like Electron or whatnot to like package apps up um, so that they can run locally on the desktop. That's probably something that we should look into more in the future. We're also actually um, sometime soon, it's on our roadmap to deploy Umbra to um, like a decentralized storage uh, solution, which, you know, uh, doesn't really alleviate the exact problem that you were describing, but is is something that I think is also useful. The app is also open source, right? So if you're a developer and you know, like the basics of, you know, NPM and stuff like that, you can pull the app down and get and spin it up and run it locally. But uh, right now we don't have a desktop app. It's probably something that we should uh, explore sometime in the future. Okay, so let's talk about the users again. So the receiver and the sender, do they both need to be Umbra users, at least in the, in the non-advanced mode? Yeah, good question. So um, just to back up real quick, I want to add something that I, I, I should have also included. We hope in the future that like this stealth address tech, like the stuff that underlies Umbra, will also be integrated in wallets so that users can use it directly in the wallet. So I think in the long run, that's like the the ideal gold standard of how users would interact with this, this stuff. It would just be like an option in your wallet. So again, you wouldn't even have to worry about those private keys, public keys existing anywhere, anywhere else. Um, and that's sort of why we develop Umbra as more of a protocol as opposed to like just adapt. We have a front end, we have a first party front end, but it's really just a set of standards that anybody can plug into. And we should talk more about our work to at the, in the future to talk about, uh, to make an EIP, a standardized EIP to, to push for exactly that uh, future. But um, so getting back to the question that you asked, which is what is the user experience like for the sender and the receiver? Do they both have to be like Umbra users? So right now the receiver, in order to receive payments, again, if you're not going to do this advanced mode thing, which we again recommend against, um, the receiver has to do one transaction per network to uh, publish their public private key pair um, that is used in the rest of the system. So if I want to receive payments with Umbra, the first step that I have to do is go to Umbra, click setup, um, and it'll say, you know, sign this message, click sign in MetaMask, and then it'll say, submit this transaction. It's a very low gas cost transaction. We've optimized it as much as possible, compressing the public keys, et cetera. And then you accept that, you pay the network fee, and it publishes those public keys. It's a one-time thing. After that, you can receive as many payments as you want from Umbra. And then what you would do as someone who wants to get paid with Umbra is you would you would send, you would tell your sender, hey, can you pay me via Umbra? Just go to this, this DAP, go to this app, go to app.umbra.cash and pay me there. Um, and so as a sender, you go to the site and you click on send and you get a form that just has like two address, 
token amount, right? Very, very straightforward. You don't have to do any setup. Um, all you have to do is fill in those fields and click send and it sends the tokens, right? Uh, or the or the ether uh, underlying it uh, via Umbra. You don't need to know any of the details of all the stuff that we just described. The software is taking care of all of that for you automatically. On chain, it looks just like, um, well, yeah, uh, we could talk a little bit more about what it looks like on chain, tokens versus ether, et cetera. But um, for you as a user, it's just like another transaction interacting with a contract. The gas fees are only slightly above what the uh, gas cost would be for a normal transaction. Again, like this is one of the advantages of Umbra compared to other privacy solutions. Like zero knowledge proofs are super cool and awesome and have a lot of uh, really cool use cases. But currently, at least, they're very uh, expensive to validate on Ethereum, right? Uh, maybe some pre-compiles in the future will make that cheaper. But right now, uh, you know, validating ZKPs uh, at the smart contract level is expensive. We're not using ZKPs. There's no, you know, zero knowledge magic happening. And so the gas costs, both for sending and receiving, are minimally minimal compared to just sending and receiving in the clear. So, um, yeah, that's um, that's a quick overview of the user experience for the receivers and the senders. So, if I um, do this via your web app, what's the information that you can glean, you as Umbra can glean from that? So, basically, if if you say send funds to me and you say um, send it to fns.eth, um, obviously Umbra will know. Um, who's sending what to whom because the address is kind of generated server-side for you, right? So the address is generated, not server-side, no, it's generated client-side, right? Client so side, okay. yeah, so the web app is doing all the generation. Um, now, if we're malicious and we publish code in our front end that isn't doing what we say it's doing or is logging things back to our server or whatever, um, then obviously we can we can get that information. But we're not, and you don't have to trust us on that. You can go look at the open source version and run it locally yourself um, to to validate that. Um, but yeah, everything is done client side. So uh, as for us uh, as Umbra, we can't. Um, what's what's visible to us is what's visible to everyone else, which is you sent a transaction to a stealth address. That stealth address looks like a brand new address on chain. We don't know who controls that stealth address. Um, and we'll never know who controls that stealth address unless unless they intentionally dox themselves um, or do something stupid on the withdrawal uh, side of things, which is something we should we should talk about uh, about pre preserving your privacy as a receiver. But um, but yeah, and same with the decryption as a receiver, right? All of that is happening client side. So unless, of course, like we talked about earlier, you delegate your viewing key to a third party intentionally. And as far as I know, there's no services doing that right now. We've we've thought about building one ourselves and. You know, giving users that option, but so far we haven't, and not sure if the demand is there for that or not at this point. Um, but unless you, so unless you delegate that to someone else intentionally, um, then everything is done client side. So if you go to the app, like all the decryption is done on our side, we don't know which stealth addresses you control or you don't. Okay, say so, um, I haven't checked in for like a month. How how long will it take me to kind of go through all the transactions to to see whether I actually received anything? Yeah, so it depends on the network, right? And it depends because it depends on how many transactions other people have sent, right? So like if if we deploy to a new network tomorrow um, and do a couple of test transactions, it'll be like instant because it's really quick. But I think the network that currently has the most transactions that have gone through Umbra is Polygon. Um, I think it's on the order of low hundreds of thousands, so maybe like. I don't know, maybe 100,000, 200,000, something like that in total um, on Polygon. Uh, I think that's right. I think that's roughly right. Um, something on that order of magnitude. Uh, and right now, I was actually just doing some testing with this yesterday because we were tracking down a, a small edge case bug. And I think on my my computer, you know, like kind of a middle of the road, uh, eight core or whatever developer machine, it was taking me like three or four minutes to decrypt everything uh, you know, to fetch the fetch the data, that actually takes uh, a, a little bit of time as well. So you have to fetch the announcements and then you have to uh, decrypt them. And, you know, it was like the total time was three or four minutes. So that's not ideal, but uh, obviously with like caching and stuff, um, that gets better. And that's currently the worst case uh, scenario for um, Polygon. Um, one thing that is, oh uh, yeah. And one thing that's worth noting there is that, um, as you said, like it gets worse as more people send transactions. And so one thing that we also do is there's a small toll associated with each 
um, send that you do on Umbra. And the reason is we don't like there's a, a, a griefing attack that you could do if you just, you know, whatever wanted like it doesn't you can't steal anything it's not stealing funds or anything but you could just make everyone's life difficult by like wash sending a bunch of you know transactions through to yourself you're not losing any money and but you're adding all these events to the send history that now become this sort of like um you know uh this sort of like uh challenge for everybody else to decrypt on their side right and so there's a small toll that's associated with each cent that you have to pay. And that's purely as like a spam mitigation method, right? So if, if you have to pay a couple of cents, which is basically what we have it set to right now for each cent, then um, you're going to be, you know, discouraged from sending thousands and thousands of these, which is what it would take to make a noticeable difference in the decryption time. And that's only on low fee networks, by the way, on mainnet, the gas fees themselves are enough deterrent to do that. But, you know, on, on rollups or side chains like Polygon, the fees are low enough that someone who just felt like, you know, <laughs> felt like causing problems for everybody could do that for pretty cheap. And so we want to make sure we have a mechanism to prevent that. Sure. What happens to the fees? Yeah, good question. Right now, they are just custodied by the contract. We have an admin key. It's the only admin. It's the only privileged role in the system that we have right now. That admin has the right to withdraw those um, fees. But uh, again, it's on the order of like cents per cent, you know, and we've had a few hundred thousand transactions across all of our networks over time. So you can kind of do the the math on how much that is. Uh, it's not a ton, but it's, it's there to uh, prevent spam. Now, it is an interesting question because we are working to try to develop an EIP standard to sort of make this like a global standard that anybody could use. And so then the question becomes like, okay, well, what do, that's fine for Umbra, which is developed by Scopelift, but what happens when this is, when we're trying to make this into a totally decentralized public good? Um, where do those fees go? Should we just burn them? Um, but uh, part of the challenge too is that you want to be able to adjust those over time, right? To say, oh, you know, gas has gone up on this roll-up network, so we actually don't even need the fee anymore. We want to set it to zero. Well, that's an admin privilege as well. So how do you, who, who gets that if you're trying to deploy this as a totally decentralized um, protocol, which is the goal? And so that becomes, uh, that is one of the challenges that we have right now and that we're trying to uh, to figure out with the CIP. You could also just read it on, right? I mean, there's no network effects at play here, right? So basically you could just always do a redeploy and kind of set it, Set, reset the fees. Yes, that would be a, an option. I guess the only like challenge with that is, you know, it just makes the like client software more complicated. You know, if there's like multiple places that you have to check if there's been payments and stuff like that. Um, so yeah, there's like a, an overhead cost associated with it, but you're right. Um, there's nothing where it's like, there's not like a liquidity pool or something like there might be with a DeFi protocol where redeploying doesn't, you know, ha a redeployment has some disadvantage compared to the original. Good point. So we've been talking about sending ETH, but obviously you could also send any ELC20 token. Um, and then in principle, um, basically, if I if I send, for instance, uh, you um, five uh, optimism tokens, you may be in a position where you cannot withdraw them from the address without doxing yourself because you have no gas, um, no ether for gas on the address. Um, how, how do you go about that? Yeah, really good question. So um, basically there are two paths in Umbra's contract and one is for sending the base asset, so ether or like Matic if you're on Polygon or whatever, and then the other path is for sending ERC-20 tokens, and they're different for exactly this reason. And so when you send Ether through Umbra, what we do is we actually take that Ether and we send it straight to the stealth address, right? And then you as the receiver, you can withdraw from that stealth address, but what that really means is just sending a transaction as that stealth address to send the Ether to wherever else you want to send it to. Um, and that's an interesting question we, I think we'll come back to in the future, but where to send it to, but but that's that's a separate question from the one you asked. As a, if you receive tokens and we did that with tokens, let's say we just sent the tokens straight to an address, like you said, you now have to fund that address. How do you do that without doxing yourself? This becomes a challenge because you have to pay gas fees to actually move the tokens. So the way that we solve that is when you send tokens in Umbra, we custody the tokens in the address and the stealth address, the stealth receiver is the own, has to sign a message in order to withdraw them. They can withdraw them directly. So you're not re completely reliant on a real area. If you can fund the stealth address without doxing yourself, that's the route you can you can choose to go. 
But by default, what's going to happen is you're going to use a relaying service to uh, to withdraw the funds uh, from from the contract. So you have to sign a message with the stealth address that received them. You have to agree when you sign that message to pay a small fee to the relayer to compensate them for the gas. And then the relayer will take your transaction and or take your signed message and use that to submit a transaction on chain that the Umber contract will validate and say, okay, yes, the stealth address agreed to let this relayer withdraw for them to pay this fee and send the tokens to this new to this other address uh, while paying the fee to the relayer. So uh, that's the system that we have in place for Umbra for ERC20 tokens. I mean, that makes total sense. How do you go about um, receiving NFTs? So basically, obviously that works for fungible tokens because you can, you can just sell it, um, you know, whatever portion of it. But if you receive an NFT, uh, how do you send it on? Yeah, so the concept of stealth addresses work for NFTs, unlike other privacy tools, right? Because you can send an NFT to a stealth address and the same properties apply in that as it would be if you were sending tokens. Like, okay, I see that you've sent it to an address, but I don't know who actually controls that address. So so unlike, you know, uh, mixers or something that rely require fungibility, the privacy properties that you get from stealth addresses apply to NFTs equally as they do to fungible tokens, which is pretty cool. Uh, there are challenges with like the one that you described, right? So currently today, uh, the current version of Umbra that we have in production does not support NFTs. Um, and this is one of the reasons why it doesn't, uh, right? Um, there are solution there are things that you could do there, the simplest and easiest, and we do hope to and plan to support NFTs in the future in future versions of Umbra. One of the easiest things that you could do there would be to give the sender the option to include some, you know, base assets and ETH uh, along with the NFT when they sent it, right? So instead of it being a transaction that just sends the NFT, the transaction could go through the smart contract, send the NFT and a small amount of ETH to the stealth address such that the user on the other side could um, use that ETH to uh, pay for gas to move the NFT in the future. So that would probably be the simplest solution. If you don't want to do that, then you get into, well, what basically mixing and matching privacy tools. So how can I fund, how can I use some other privacy tool to fund the stealth address um, in a non-doxed way such that I can then uh, re remove the uh, the NFT without revealing myself? You alluded to this idea, even after having received something on, on a new stealth address, um, there's a myriad of ways to kind of still give my identity away. Um, so what, what should I do? Uh, maybe I can turn it around. What shouldn't I do? <laughs> Good question. Yeah. So, so the obvious thing that you shouldn't do is just immediately send the funds from your stealth address to a, a doxed wallet, right? If you do that, it's going to be pretty obvious that this, these were funds that were um, sent to you. So, and that's actually like a lot harder to communicate than you would think to users. And this is one of the challenges that we've had with Umbro, which is the uh, crypto community as a whole has kind of, because it was basically the first privacy solution available mixers were, that is, um, the crypto community has kind of anchored on mixers as like their um, their mental model around what privacy tools mean in crypto. And so a lot of people think like, okay, well, if it went in and then I take it out, well, it's private or something, you know, like as if like that's just, there's like some magic that happened in between the two things, but that's not the case, right? You've sent it to a new address. And so if you want to preserve your privacy, you have to make choices that, that do that, right? Um, Right now, there are not a ton of great options. So one option would be, this is probably, I would say, the biggest challenge that stealth addresses still have. And I think we're exploring a bunch of possible ways to solve this, but um, but there's, uh, you know, there's, um, it's, it's, a, it's still a challenge. So one option would be if you've received funds to a stealth address, you can either just leave the funds in that stealth address or withdraw them to a new, a brand new address and just continue using that address, right? So if you receive like a big payment of ETH or something like that, that's like an easy thing to do. You could then take that ETH and swap it and, you know, invest in DeFi or do whatever and just continue using, um, continue using that, uh, that address and no one except the person you sent it to you knows that you control it, right? Um, that's fine. If you have, now the one obvious question is, well, even that solution doesn't work for tokens, right? So what do you do with tokens? One of the things that we've built into the Umbra contracts is this concept of a post withdrawal hook. And the post withdrawal hook uh, basically says, 
when you take your funds out of Umbra, when you withdraw your funds from Umbra, not only can you move the funds to some other location, but you can take arbitrary ac actions as well. So you can basically do an arbitrary transaction on the network in addition to moving your funds at the same time. And you can submit that all through the relayers. You can pay for the relayer to do it. And so like one example of a post withdrawal hook that we could build, we actually have the contracts for this, but we haven't integrated it into the front end yet. But it's a question as to whether the UX is good or, or not and whether users really want it. But uh, one of the things we could build, for example, would be if you receive DAI, say you receive uh, 10,000 DAI, and you want to do what I just described, which is just keep using that without, you know, on chain, without uh, doxing yourself, um, you could do a post withdrawal hook to swap some of that DAI for ETH. So now you have, you know, uh, 9,000 900 die in a new address with $100 worth of ETH to pay gas fees. And then you can, you know, deposit it in Aave and earn yield or whatever else you want to do, right? So the broader point is that this, this idea of a post withdraw hook gives us the surface area to integrate. And the fact that, you know, Ethereum is a composable chain and has all these other things available gives us the surface area to integrate with other things that allow you to make privacy preserving um, decisions. So a, another obvious option would be, you know, there's a bunch of other privacy tools out there um, that do different things. Like just just one that we've we've done some work with them and we're interested in in their tool as well is called Railgun. I don't know if you're familiar with with Railgun at all, but it's an interesting privacy solution. Um, but you Aztec would be another one that your that your users would be familiar with, right? So when you think about those kinds of uh, solutions, they're solutions where you kind of have to enter into a shielded uh, ecosystem, right? And so you could create a post withdrawal hook where you withdraw your funds and immediately shield them into some other uh, privacy preserving ecosystem like Aztec or Railgun or, or any other that, that, could, that is or could be developed in the future, right? Um, so that's another sort of like on-chain native solution. The truth is that what I think most of our users are doing today is a lot less sexy, but is practical for a lot of use cases, which is they get paid with Umbra, like say they're doing some work for a DAO. You know, we've talked to users who are doing this. They're getting paid by a DAO. They don't want that completely legible on chain. The DAO pays them via Umbra, and then they withdraw their funds directly to an exchange, right? And so they send the funds to an exchange and they cash out to fiat or send them back on chain somewhere else, you know, effectively using the um, the exchange as a, as a mixer. Um, obviously not a very good mixer because the exchange knows who you are, right? So you have to be okay with that that privacy trade-off. But again, for a lot of use cases, that is uh, acceptable. I mean, even if you're okay with the exchange knowing who, who you are, uh, these days exchanges only give you one deposit address. So if you use that trick, and it, it's like a one, one, one-time trick. <laughs> yeah, it depends. Different, different exchanges do different things. A lot of them do do one uh, deposit address per asset these days. You know, if you don't, if you only ever used it for Umbra, right, then it allows you to consolidate the payments. So you can say like, okay, these different payments all must have been going to the same entity, but you still don't know who that entity is. But you're right. It's a problem. So yeah, there are, um, there, this, this is, I would say the biggest challenge that stealth address addresses have. The privacy properties are really nice in terms of receiving payments in this non-interactive way that aren't obvious on chain, but then it's not necessarily easy to make privacy preserving, um, decisions. Uh, after that, after you've received the payments, right? And so this is one of the things that we're working on. As I alluded to, there's this possibility for integrations via these withdrawal hooks. And I think it's one of the places where we can make a lot of uh, improvements in the future. Um, and like I, like I said before, like I don't think stealth addresses are like a, um, are like the silver bullet for privacy. Like they're, they're one tool that has a specific or a set of specific use cases and, and properties that are useful for certain things. And I think in the long term, in general for for the ethereum ecosystem and for you know crypto ecosystems in general i think the there's not going to be like one tool that like oh this is how you do privacy it's going to be more like there's a bunch of different tools that give you different properties and you have to sort of know how to use them in conjunction with each other to get the level of privacy that you want and need um for whatever your kind of situation is and i think we can do a lot to make that the ux for doing that easier um but i think that's sort of the reality of of privacy uh, in crypto is that there's there's always going to be multiple tools and you'll have to understand the properties of the different tools and and make decisions to kind of like get the, the level of privacy you need. Yeah, I mean, as a user, I mean, to us, it seems almost normal. But I mean, if, if you explain it to anyone else, 
it would seem crazy, right? Basically, it's like, um, yeah, so um, w what actually happens is you have several wallets um, in your in your different pockets and, you know, you can't, you can't mix and you can't put like uh, $5 from one to the other or everyone will know that they both belong to you. And if you, if you want to, if you want to kind of consolidate, you have to tr you have to get like really big pass, um, kind of like the Aztec or Railgun analogy, and you have to put it in the pass. And then in the pass, you can you can exchange m money from one uh, wallet to into a new wallet. And then basically, there's a not to abstract away here for the average user. <laughs> There is, for sure. And so the UX, there's a ton of work to do to make the UX better. Um, you know, I think like a couple things I would say to that. One is that all of that does sound insane and, and is to a certain extent, like it'll get better, but it's never going to be, it's never going to be like, it's never going to be zero friction, right? Um, like all other things being equal, a, a solution that gives you more privacy is probably going to have some additional friction and some additional cost than a solution that doesn't, right? Just sort of logically, that's the the case. And then so users have to decide the level of privacy that they want and need and are willing to pay for and willing to put up for with an additional amount of friction. Um, one of the things, by the way, that is just a reality of the privacy space, uh, in my opinion, and I learned this firsthand with Umbra, is that privacy is one of those things that everyone says they want and everyone says that they're willing to put up with some friction or additional cost to get. But revealed preferences seem to be that a large chunk of the population, a majority, a large majority, actually uh, doesn't feel that way. Because if you put even the smallest amount of friction or additional cost in their way to achieve privacy, they just don't do it. Um, they choose not to do it. And so, um, yeah, that that's just like, you know, for some of us, like myself, like it just is, that's insane. Like it just like, we like, why would, you know, but that, that does seem to, to be the reality. Um, that's okay. Like people can and should make the decisions that they want, but we want these tools to exist and to have the lowest friction and barriers as possible um, out there. The other thing that I'll say about something that makes building a privacy tool challenging is that um, there are users out there who do care about privacy and care about it quite a lot. And um, for whatever reason, um, maybe their circumstances, maybe just their disposition, really want the maximum privacy that they can get and they are willing to pay for it. Um, it turns out though... <laughs> that it's really hard to talk to those people because they value their privacy. And so <laughs> doing user research for a privacy tool and understanding the use cases that people care about and what they're using and what they're not is really hard um, because those people don't want to talk to you for good reason, right? So uh, this is just a, a general structural problem with creating privacy tools. It's really hard to understand your user base. It's really understand hard to understand if you have product market fit or not. Um, and, you know, I don't have a great answer to that. We kind of just have to like stumble forward. I mean, even something like as simple as like we right, the Umbra app does not have any client side analytics in it at all. Right. And that's because we felt like it doesn't really seem uh, right to like have a privacy tool and a front end for our privacy tool and then be like logging every single action that our user takes tied to their IP address. Right. So we don't do that. Um, but that handicaps us. Right. Because we don't know like, oh, like that feature that we shipped are people really using that or not? Like we don't know and we can't tell easily, right? Um, you know, some things have like a footprint on chain that you can follow. Like, okay, we know that people are sending this token because we can see the funds flowing through. We don't know who they're sending them to, but they're, they're doing it. So obviously like people wanted to, to send that token. Um, but we don't, you know, other than that, like more detailed, intricate stuff, we don't know uh, because we choose not to, um, you know, invade our user's privacy because it's a privacy tool and that would be counterproductive, right? So, um, it's just a it's just a structural a structural problem with developing privacy tools. I would say in general, I also find that people usually say they they value their privacy, but n no one actually runs their own node. I mean, in Fiora, sees everything you do. <laughs> correct, correct, yes. But it's not right. it, it's not that difficult to run one, but people don't care, right? So basically, then kind of you need to be quick and um, same for sort of same for desktop um, uh, apps. So. I think people should really use them. Anyways, I have one more and one more um, area that I would kind of like to explore, um, and that's smart wallets and account abstraction. So, in my understanding, kind of using the stealth address um, model 
only works for EOAs, right? It doesn't work for smart contract wallets as um, it does. Okay, fantastic. I see you nodding. So talk me through it. So sort of like, so the scheme, the, the, the scheme that we use today that I described earlier is we have you use your EOA to sign a message to uh, generate that public private key pair. We effectively do that as a um, convenience layer thing, right? Like it, it's a, because we want the, um, we want users to be able to, to, to use the setup they already have, which for most people is a, a wallet like MetaMask or a wallet connect wallet on their phone or whatever with an EOA, right? And, and so that's sort of like the setup that we have today. Um, signing messages, but, but there's no reason that that is the way that the, that you have to generate the public private key pair in that way. Right. So like you can generate a public private key pair in any way that you would like. And, uh, as long as you publish it in the registry and don't lose the associated private keys, then, then you're good. Um, and so there's nothing that like prevents this from working with, uh, uh, a different wallet. And in fact, you know, these, um, account abstraction law, some of the ones that exist, I'm not going to be able to remember off the top of my head, but there's like a standard for how they do message signing, like how you sign a message with a notice to save or whatever. Like, you know, maybe, maybe you would know a bit more about that actually, but, um, you know, the, um, yeah, th there are ways that you can do that. Now where it gets tricky is like some of these wallets, they have like the idea of like social recovery and stuff like that. Right. Where it's like you, if you, you can completely lose your private keys and still like get all of your assets back. Um, that part doesn't work with Umbra because at the end of the day, there is a public and a private key. Uh, there is a, there is a public key published somewhere and that's the public key that someone is using to, to generate the stealth address that's receiving the funds. And so there has to be a private key that you like preserve somewhere, right. And don't lose. And so if you, you know, use some wallet that has account abstraction and social re recovery and you lose the private key that's associated with that. Um, and the one that you, you lose the private key that was used to like generate the public key on Umbra. And then someone sends you funds, um, just because you social recovered the rest of your app doesn't mean you're going to be able, or the rest of your, your assets that were stored in that, that wallet doesn't mean you're going to be able to go get your funds that haven't yet been withdrawn from Umbra out of the system, right? Because those funds were sent using a specific public key. If you lose that private key, there's, there's nothing that we can do, right? So I wouldn't say it's not possible to use with these, you know, smart wallets and whatnot. It just adds like a layer, a, a little bit of layer of complexity. And it, again, at the end of the day, you have to, you have to retain this, this key material, right? Um, and if, you know, today, if you're using an EOA, we do that via the signature. So it's not a big deal. You already have to retain the key material of your EOA. You're fine. But when you get into these like social recovery mechanisms and whatnot, it, it adds a layer of, um, of complexity that you have to think about. Maybe switching gears a little bit. Um, how do you think we get to a world where people care about privacy, right? Because basically, if you think on it, there have been so many revelations over, say, the last 20 years or so. Back in the day, people said, you know, wh why would anyone spy on me? I'm boring. I have nothing to hide um, and so on. <laughs> uh, but it's become so apparent that this is not a blocker, even if you're really boring. Lots of things can still be learned from you and and are learned from you, um, unless you are incredibly um, sophisticated. Um, what do you think it would take for people to win back their outrage and kind of ask to take back their privacy or just take back their, their privacy? Do you think um, it's it's kind of a little bit like you know the analogy with um, the frog? It's being slowly boiled, right? So what, when's the point you kind of jump out? Is it a way to kind of make people care um, about their own privacy? I don't know if there, if there was, I, w I wish I knew it. I, I don't know. The, I don't, I don't know is the short answer. I mean, well, I have a few thoughts on it. Like in terms of like individuals, like quote unquote, everyday people, whatever that, that means, normies, yeah, not meant pejoratively uh, at all. Like, I I'm not sure the majority of them are, are ever going to care unless like things get really bad in whatever jurisdiction or, you know, particular locale that they're in. Right. Like, and, and, um, and they really are being targeted in an obvious and visceral way that motivates them to, uh, you know, really start taking it seriously. Um, I just, you know, I'm not sure that, and so maybe we can move the dial a little bit, get a higher percentage of people to start caring, but I'm not sure that, uh, you know, unless, unless for you as an individual, things get really bad. Your most people are going to care. Uh, and you know, look at, at to a certain to part of the answer is like, that's 
And maybe that's okay. Like if people want to make those decisions, like that's, that's their prerogative, et cetera, et cetera. You know, t- to me, it's like self-evident that you should want, um, better privacy, but like, obviously it seems not to be for everyone, right. Um, that that's like a, a self-evidently good thing. So yeah, it's just an interesting, interesting reality. Um, and I'm not sure I have an answer on the individual level. One thing that I will note, and this is like part of our thesis with Umbra as well, is that like, whereas individual, you, you know, people seem not to en masse care about privacy as much as they quote unquote should, whatever that means, right? Like, uh, it, it does seem, it seems self-evident that businesses and commercial applications care about some level of privacy more than, a, more than maybe the average user does, right? So if you're a business and you have some relationship with a vendor and you're paying them some amount, right? That's not something that you're trying to hide from like a nation state, but it isn't something that you want blasted out in public for everyone, right? And same with maybe like uh, things like um, paying for things on e-commerce, right? Like I think that this is another example where maybe you can get like the average user to care at least a little bit, right? Like, okay, would you want every single e-commerce vendor that you used, like, is there anything that you buy that maybe you don't want everyone know, knowing that you're buying that thing, right? Like, like maybe it would be better if there was some kind of privacy payment system that, that kept that at least, um, not completely legible. So, um, yeah, I mean, I I don't know. I don't have a, a, a silver bullet there. I think, um, certain people are just never going to care. People will care maybe when it's things get really bad in their particular situation businesses will care. And then some percentage of the population does care. And um, I think we just have to find ways to, to make these tools available so that when and if people need them or want them, you know, they have, have the option and, and make it as easy as possible to, to adopt them. I think that's, that's a fair assessment. So um, where can people learn more about Umbra? Where can they um, look at the code? Where can they uh, join the community? Absolutely. So you can go to app.umbra.cash to uh, use the app. Um, you can, you know, publish your uh, keys with one uh, cheap transaction, and then you can receive payments there. You can join our Discord, which is linked on the site as well, and um, that is where we do announcements and people chat. And you know, if there's ever any tech support or anything needed, you can find it there. The GitHub page is also linked on the app, but it's uh, scopelift slash uh, Umbra dash protocol. And it's a mono repo that has the front end, the smart contracts and the the, the SDK um, for interacting with uh, those contracts all are hosted there. And you can uh, check that out if you're a developer. And then uh, Umbra is on Twitter at at Umbra Cash, and you can follow us there for announcements and whatnot as well. Perfect. Thank you so much for coming on, Ben. It's been a pleasure. Thank you very much. It's really been a great conversation. I appreciate it.